This video is brought to you by Altium, my favorite PCB design tool. What's up guys? I have a new idea and if it works, it's going to make my FlexLED project so much cooler. Okay, so let me try and explain what I have in mind. If you don't know, this is a POV display I developed a couple of months ago. It had a couple of issues and since then I've been trying to brainstorm and tackle every one of those issues. One of the things I would like to improve is the actuating angle. This old model has this sort of old TRT vibes look to it, which limits the angle to around 4 to 5 degrees. I think you can amplify that. The current version has one large neodymium magnet at the bottom. Now my idea is what if we could add another neodymium magnet and play around with their position. I think this way it should definitely be improved. I might have been too optimistic about this because I'm starting the test with a 180 degrees actuating angle. Also, I'm using flexor to validate this idea. So let's turn it on and vary the frequency. The coolest thing about this is that I don't think that this is being overstressed, but let's take some slow mo to validate this. The angle is not that sharp. Now, underneath here, there is another level of magnet. So, the question is does it still actuate if I remove these magnets? I don't think so. <laughs> let's keep them on. So now let's try it with the FlexLED PCB. Spoiler it didn't work that well. The coil could not get attracted to the magnet at the 180 degrees test. And when I tried moving the magnets, the best result I got was around 130 degrees. So why is this happening? The only noticeable difference that I could notice between FlexLED and my other flexible projects was the cover lace material. This one was sort of more transparent than the FlexLED. I asked my PCB manufacturer about this and they confirmed that there was a difference in the dielectric and the cover lace thickness. There is also the fact that Flexar has a thinner arm which also reduces the stiffness. I'm also not sure if the weight of the LEDs and the extra coils are affecting, but in theory they should create more momentum. Another unknown question I have is can the copper break from all this flexing? I don't know, the best thing is to test it, so in the next few weeks I'm thinking about starting a super long test to test how many flaps can Flexar make. But this is not going to stop me from designing the next version of FlexLED, I mean we can always limit the angle and test accordingly. This brings us to the second part of this video, designing version 3. In the last FlexLED video almost everybody in the comments wanted me to make a larger version. Some people also wanted me to make it like 720p, which would be cool but totally unrealistic. Well, not totally unrealistic, because all you have to do is connect a display that has some super tiny pixels and flex them. Totally realistic. So I started the hunt on the internet to try and find the best display possible. But I just couldn't find one, because most displays I found looked super heavy. I did find some paper thin displays, but they were unnecessarily wide for my application. I wanted a display that is narrow, light and ideally side viewed, but till now I haven't found it, unless it's some super expensive customized solution. So I'm going to stick with LEDs, but I'm going to add more. Now these RGB LEDs I use for version 2 are super tiny and fragile. They can easily break even with some tweezers, so flexing them at around 30 Hz is not totally recommended. This flexing motion is exerting a force on the LEDs, which can be interpreted as overstress or overuse. There is one and only one way we can ensure that our new LEDs are super macho. macho, macho man, yeah. Select an LED that has an ACQ rating. That means I'm going to use an LED that can pass the harsh automotive stress test. It's going to be an expensive solution, but it's the only way I can ensure that the LEDs on FlexLED are rated for a lifetime of flapping. Now the thing is that I only found one family of LEDs that has this ACQ rating and are right angled. They are only single color but have a huge 4 by 36 by 3.8 mm high package. This is how they compare to the RGB LEDs I was using. So I'm not even sure if the coil could flap 8 of these LEDs, let alone 24. 
This may sound a little crazy, but if there is a slight chance I could increase the display size, I'm going to take it. I'm putting the maximum amount of LEDs the driver can power. If the coil manages to flap all these 24 LEDs, good for me, else we start unsoldering and chopping them off one by one. Now given that this LED is monocolor, it will limit the shapes this new prototype can display, but at least the viewing area will be larger. When I tested this LED, I accidentally reversed biased it, and it lit up red. So it's actually two color, but the datasheet never mentions this feature, and it actually gives a specific warning not to reverse bias it, so I'm not going to. I decided to put these LEDs in a 4-5mm semicircular shape. If this design choice works, it gives me the option to use flex LED as a curved angle or a semispherical display. From some other tests I made, I also decided to use only one coil instead of two because I didn't see any huge benefit to keep using two. The single coil approach should have the flexible part lighter and have less drag. I was also going to make this extra structure to improve the display stability, but then I decided to try and keep things light as possible. To improve the LED's robustness, I'm just going to add a stiffener underneath the LED's to prevent this area from bending. I'm also going to add a stiffener underneath the electronics area, which should reduce the PCBs caused by a factor of 8. The circuit will be almost identical to that of version 2, I'm just going to change the age bridge driver. But there's one more thing I would like to add. If we go back to our initial proof of concept, there's going to be one big problem for the LEDs. The coil is smashing into the magnets. Ideally, we code in the perfect timing and flip the coil polarity exactly when it's going to hit the magnet. It will sort of look like this. And this should work, but mechanical reassembly or slight environmental disturbances like the wind can off tune it. So I have to close the loop and add a sensor to get the coil polarity flipping on point on every flap. Now there are a bunch of sensor options I have considered for this application and every option has its flaws but I have decided to go with capacitive proximity sensing. I'm not 100% confident that it's going to work but if it does it's going to be the cheapest and most compact solution. The way I'm going to do it is by having two electrodes underneath the two magnets. The magnets are conductive, so they will basically turn into one big touchpad. And when the coil approaches the magnet, there should be a change in capacitance and the touch should be detected. That's exactly when the microcontroller will be externally interrupted to flip the coil's polarity. This weird looking PCB was designed using Altium, which is also this video sponsor. I believe that Altium is the best circuit design tool, because it's professional, reliable and easy to use. You can basically design anything with it that involves electronics. And they just released this new cloud based platform that allows you to review changes from any mobile device and share them online. If you're interested in getting a free trial, check out the link in the description. This week's video ends here, this was sort of a part 1. Part 2 is coming in the next few weeks, more like 1 month, 2 months, because I have 3 other projects I would like to finish before I receive the PCBs, electronics and my new 3D printer, then I can start developing it, so make sure to stay tuned for my next electronics invention. I just want to say one last thing, because while editing the video I had the coolest idea. If the semispherical design works, we could connect two back to back and make a flex led sphere. That would be so cool, let's hope it works.